Hello, my name is Lindsay Shoger. I am a clinical PT at RHI and I also work as a research PT in the Locomotor Recovery Lab of Indiana University. Today I will talk to you about the implementation of high intensity training in inpatient stroke rehab. Here at RHI, we have a 64 bed inpatient rehab hospital in which 30% of total admissions or more than 300 patients each year come to us after having a stroke. In 2016, leadership was hopeful to increase the use of evidence to improve patient outcomes, as well as to improve the rate of patients returning home instead of another facility. Conventionally, PT interventions focus on improving impairments such as strength, range of motion, and balance to improve mobility. However, recent evidence indicates that more focused practice of a skill, um, targeted skill, can have better results. In 2008, Kleem and Jones proposed that of the 10 principles of neuroplasticity, there are a few that are most easily manipulated in a physical therapy intervention. Specificity, in our case, walking, repetition, a lot of walking, and intensity, making it challenging um, or challenging walking in a way that increases heart rate or exertion. In stroke 2010, Moore shows that the more practice patients get with stepping or repetition at an increased intensity, results in greater functional gains in the area of walking. These graphs show that a significant difference occurs in the change of daily stepping at home following four weeks of treadmill training as compared to the last four weeks of conventional therapy right before a patient was to be discharged for plateau. More importantly, on this graph, a dose-response relationship is shown in that the more steps during either PT, uh, traditional PT or treadmill training resulted in greater change in stepping habits at home. This data set suggests that perhaps we as clinicians should consider exercise as for stepping as a medicine for PT, where there is an optimal dose to receive, excuse me, or to achieve an optimal response. There were similar findings in subacute and chronic stroke, as well as in chronic spinal cord injury. In 2015, therapists at a rehab center in Chicago wanted to determine how feasible it was to maximize stepping practice and how much that would look like. In addition to identifying that high quantity stepping was feasible, they also concluded that the quantity of steps per day was a primary predictor for location of disposition, meaning that as the patients practice more walking, they become more independent and then ultimately had a higher incidence of returning home. This group, however, didn't have any control group to compare the results to. In 2020, a study based out of Norway did utilize a control group by monitoring stepping practice and had outcomes or and outcomes during usual care for a year, and then implemented high intensity training for one year. High intensity training groups had greater changes in outcomes in inpatient rehab than usual care, and it was related to the amount of stepping practice. By comparison to the US, however, their, their patient population admits to rehab centers at a much higher level of function, which is a limitation in this study. So here at RHI, our primary question was, does implementing high intensity training significantly affect walking outcomes as compared to usual care during inpatient stroke rehab in a typical US rehabilitation center? The implementation plan was originally to consist of two phases, with phase one being slated for one year of implementing outcomes, setting up equipment, and gathering data about current practice. Efforts to change practice from conventional PT intervention to high intensity training was slated for the following two years. In actuality, phase one was shortened to only nine months as sufficient data was gathered and equipment training had occurred. Phase two was dubbed the transitional phase and lasting 18 months. And then phase three was known as the high intensity phase covering months 27 to 39. During phase one, the focus is on efforts to collect data, including use of outcome measures and step counts. To increase standardization and completion of outcome measures throughout the PT team, strategies included training videos with competency quizzes, as well as an in-service on using them to guide clinical decision making. Step watch monitors were placed daily on patient ankles by research staff to help track stepping data of patients included. Implementation of high intensity training was initiated during phase two, meaning that high intensity gait training was the goal as a primary PT intervention. A top down and bottom up approach was implemented here. 
Facilitators of implementation of high intensity included leadership support from the CEO, medical director, and therapy director. Patients whose most frequently stated goals were to learn to walk again and to be able to go home. And having research site staff on site for co-treats, equipment maintenance, and rapid development of resources to facilitate implementation, such as tags that went on name badges to help with, target, uh, with identifying target heart rates for training, um, and outcome measure resources. Barriers of high intensity implementation included current PT practice and beliefs, patient and caregiver preferences, and organizational processes. This pie graph is a breakdown of how time was spent during 63 observed PT sessions. And although you can see that the most practice activity was gait, you also see that many different interventions were provided with a mixture of functional tasks and impairment-based treatments like strengthening or stretching. This is also very similar to what's been reported at other clinical sites. Additionally, clinicians were concerned about how to make their documentation appear skilled if they were just walking the patient, as well as other concerns about implementation, like their patient not being able to stand up on their own to walk, or not having enough strength to lift their leg, or making assumptions that their patients weren't going to be okay with working as hard as we wanted them to do. One potential limitation in this type of intervention is related to patient and or family preferences. Some have experiences with PT intervention um, changing that they expect for their PT plan of care, especially early on when patients might see other patients not doing walking interventions and not working very hard. Um, some patients indeed were not really motivated to work hard. And then finally, uh, caregivers at times would be uneasy about seeing their loved ones work hard and walking um, in a way that looks abnormal. And then finally, um, organizationally, interdisciplinary division of goals um, would be changing from a traditional approach to this new approach um, where OTs might have developed their plan of care on the assumption that PTs were also working on transfers and so had to change the way they practice to improve um, their patients' outcomes in that way. And then um, additionally, um, during PT scheduled sessions, PTs, excuse me, patients were regularly not ready for therapy. Um, they were found to be still in bed, not dressed. Um, medication administration and uh, physician rounding would frequently occur during scheduled PT treatment time, which interfered with the time spent with actual physical therapy treatment. Additionally, patients uh, could be considered too tired after high intensity training to actively participate in other therapies. Um, and finally, uh, non-therapy staff didn't always understand why therapy activities couldn't be restricted to the gym. So we would regularly have administrative staff calling the lab, um, asking them to come and move the hurdles or ladders, um, ankle weights, wheelchairs, et cetera, um, out of the main areas. Implementation of high intensity training essentially required the de-implementation of current physical therapy practice that is taught throughout the programs in the United States. Weekend courses were offered at onset implementation phase and then several times thereafter for training additional staff that came on board. We also had to train the therapy techs to increase treatment efficiency, including numbering AFOs, um, training on gate equipment, and how to physically assist during training. Mentoring was completed with the research staff, and the physician orders um, were to include high intensity training to help reduce uncertainty early on regarding who was appropriate for this type of, um, of treatment process. Additionally, um, objective feedback on stepping activity, initially given by patient performance and then later by individual therapists, um, was provided to help identify if goals were being achieved. In addressing the barriers of patient and caregiver preferences, we could provide education to the families and patients and which allowed them to make an informed decision about their plan of care options. Many people stated that they wanted to have the outcomes associated with the high intensity training strategies and so they opted to give it a try. Education included 
the dose response relationship associated with step quantity, um, the importance of allowing errors or even imposing errors, and walking practice to improve overall retention of their learned walking capabilities. Um, and the fact that walking performance can be a major determining factor in whether the person returns home after discharge or requires a stay at a skilled nursing facility following rehab. Addressing the barrier of the organizational processes uh, required interdisciplinary buy-in. Um, so providing a lot of staff education, having a dialogue on why we want to implement and do high intensity training uh, for the benefit of our patients. Um, trying to get the patients on regular therapy schedules to help with the nursing routine, attempting to minimize those early sessions um, so that they have a, more time to have their meds administered or help them get dressed, um, encouraging physician rounding during rest breaks or outside of PT time, and um, having OT um, pr practicing more of the transfer training. Um, and when, once the high intensity training program got going, many of these areas became less of an issue. Um, additionally, sometimes our patients were really fatigued at the high, end of high intensity training, um, or they had an increase in their arm tone or spasticity. Um, and in these cases, scheduling was adjusted to avoid being after the PT sessions. Um, other times, patients were found to be more alert and engaged in their activities following high intensity training. And so, um, if that was the case, scheduling may have been adjusted to have um, other disciplines like speech therapy following uh, the PT tra training sessions to increase their patient engagement. So what was our goal during this time? Um, our goals were to have a significant increase in steps each day. And then with walking practice um, being a, the majority chunk of the pie. Um, and then finally, having that target heart rates um, were set at 70 to 80 percent of the heart rate max um, and then that was eventually updated to 75 to 85 percent partway through implementation because the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines were updated. So in these line graphs we see that a general increase for walking being practiced um, and prioritized in a session um, occurred from the usual care phase into the transition phase and then a more substantial jump um, and these measures occurred in the high intensity phase in quarter seven through 10. And that's shown consistently on both graphs. Similar results here are noted for documentation of intensity and achievement of targeted intensity. So usual care, transition, and then a little bit of a jump for high intensity training. So as pointed out, there was a sudden and consistent increase in walking practice and targeting of high intensity training or high intensity heart rates in quarter seven through 10. And so you might think, what changed here? Um, specifically, uh, there was a change in therapy leadership uh, and their perspective went from supporting the initiative of using high intensity training and PT treatment to setting it as an expectation of practice. And then there was also a change from patient specific feedback on step quantities to therapy, uh, therapist specific feedback on that as well. So in our questions guiding analysis, um, the first question is, were the patients similar in all the phases? And this chart here shows that there were no group differences in demographics, such as gender, age, incidence of beta blockers, um, uh, days post-stroke, and comorbidities. And then additionally, um, this graph here shows um, that the chart shows that data are non-normally distributed and that um, the numbers here, it's important to recognize, are represented as a median um, and interquartile ranges are represented, or represented excuse me, um, and they are not means. Um, as you can see, usual care had significantly higher balance scores at admission when compared to the other two phases. Um, indicating that they were less likely um, or li they were likely less impaired and that strength impairment and initial walking measures of speed and endurance were similar in all the groups. So here's the strength and here are our walking measures showing no group differences. Length of stay was significantly greater in the high intensity training phase um, when compared to either of the two groups, but even with the longer length of stay, 
um, <clears throat> although it was a significant difference um, from the the transition. Um, sorry, excuse me. There was a significant difference that wasn't enough to explain the larger change in outcomes that we'll see later. Our second question was, were we successful in implementing high intensity gate training? And so what we have here is that there was a significant difference in average number of steps per day for each um, patient between the high intensity phase when compared to either the transition phase um, and the usual care phase. However, there was not a significant difference between the transition and the usual care phases. The data also indicates that there was a significant change between each group um, indicating that walking was practiced and prioritized in more sessions and targeted intensity levels were achieved more as well, with the high intensity training being more than the transition phase being more than the usual care phase. And our final question in our, um, our analysis is, did the high intensity gait training impact our patient outcomes? So these uh, graphs here show that the walking based outcome measures um, the six minute walk test measuring endurance, 10 meter walk test measuring speed. Um, um, we did see a significant difference in performance between the high intensity phase group as compared to either the usual care or the transition phase. Um, and again, indicated by the line showing this is a significant change between high intensity and transition and a significant change between high intensity and usual care. Um, these same figures also show that early attempts at high intensity was not sufficient to affect outcomes. Um, so basically saying that the, there was not really a significant change in walking um, measures from the transition to the usual care phase. Now, while there was not a significant change in balance scores between groups, it's worth considering that in the usual care phase, um, balance was specifically practiced as part of the plan of care, while in the high intensity group, um, it wasn't practiced individually outside of walking. And so, um, but it did still have similar gains despite not being practiced separately. One of the common themes of clinician concerns recruit regarding increasing the intensity of work for patients was the potential for adverse effects. And as you can see in this chart, there was not an increase in adverse events with substantial levels of significance um, between each of the phases. Uh, additionally, there was not a statistically significant difference between phases and the non-significant adverse events, um, basically saying that um, there wasn't a difference between falls without injury between the groups. Um, despite having the patients admitted with much higher fall risk in the transitional and the high intensity phases. In summary, outcome measure collection was at 80% across the entire study. Um, and then the therapists were able to demonstrate a significant change in steps per day, prioritizing walking practice more than in usual care um, and improving monitoring intensity and targeting high intensity during their treatment sessions. And these changes um, did have a um, change in the practice did have um, a result of significant changes in our patient outcomes um, that improved their walking and their likelihood for discharge to home.